Billy Fury was Britain's original rock and roll idol. He became an overnight success in 1958, was nicknamed Britain's Elvis Presley, and became an inspiration to artists such as John Lennon and Morrissey. Fury's mean and moody brand of rock and roll separated him from Cliff Richard and Marty Wilde. Billy Fury, the rocker, would give way in the 1960s to the romantic balladeer who captivated a whole generation of women. But behind Billy Fury lay Ronnie Witcherly, a shy, fragile teenager from Liverpool. Britain's Elvis died at just 42 years old, exactly the same age as the king of rock and roll himself. Despite his tragically short life, Billy Fury has left behind a legacy of music and memories that are still cherished by his fans all over the world. This is his wondrous story. Billy just had something when he walked on stage. He was a star. They started with a spotlight on his crotch, which I think had been padded out. <laughs> <laughs> and then the spotlight enlarged, you see, and you saw this very handsome young man. I'm only to Billy could do the rock and roll and put himself about, or he could actually do romantic ballads, uh, which of course drove all the ladies even wilder. A thousand stars in the skies Like the stars in your eyes The screaming from the girls in the audience was um, absolutely deafening. Honey, you'll do more than anything But don't knock upon my door I don't want you anymore I don't love you as before Will you get in just a call? Everybody in the room realises, wow, this guy's good looking, he can play guitar, he can sing, and he wrote the song. Well, that was unheard of in those days. Ronnie Richley went off, and the next time I saw him, he was Billy Fury. Don't make me blue. And off we went to Manchester, the Stratford uh, Soldo. And in the foyer of the Stratford Soldo already was a big sign saying, tonight, meet the new teenage rage Billy Fury. The nice thing was he crossed over. He, he wasn't just for the girls. The boys liked him too, because he was a rocker. But he was like the James Dean of singers. He was our Elvis Presley. This guy walked up to Billy right in front of if you'll wiggle your bum once more, I'll smash your face in. Girls were all round the back, end, climbing on the wall and everything. Bill leapt over the counter and tried to shoot out the back. The next minute, 2,000 girls clambered into the shop, knocked all the gear over, the men knocked a guy on the floor and everything like that. I found a place for the job. In the 1960s, he had more hit singles than, than the Beatles. It's a great story. There should have been a movie about it. As a matter of fact, there's one being written. A wondrous place. Billy Fury was born Ronald Witcherly on April the 17th, 1940, at Smithdown Road Hospital in Liverpool. Like all babies born during the early days of World War II, there was no certainty of what the future held for the young Ronnie, his mother Jean and father Albert. Ronnie's younger brother Albie was also a wartime baby and the family were often caught up in the Luftwaffe's bombing raids during the war. 
These frequent evacuations to cold air raid shelters during the night would contribute to the health problems which Ronnie and Albie suffered in later life. Billy was six and a half when his dad came out of the army. I had the two boys right through the war. When he was about six, he developed the rheumatic fever. And of course, he was in hospital for a long time. Oh, I just thought it was great. I've got this bedroom to myself. You know, because we used to have a double bed which we shared, you see. When I was seven, I got rheumatic fever. So I ended up in hospital. And it seemed to be, um, he'd be in, then he'd be out, and then I'd be in. So of course, I had a couple of years of in and out of hospital, and he did. When he was seven and a half, he had another occurrence. And then it seemed to put him back a little bit, you know, with, with schooling. I was always sick, I was always in hospital, and, and doctors, or I was lying in bed somewhere. And I missed a hell of a lot of my schooling. And every time I got back to school, I didn't know the kids. I was a kind of, a, I was always, always the stranger. He went to piano lessons and he really enjoyed playing the piano. But then again, it wasn't, it wasn't the rock and roll, what he wanted to do. Very talented and a lot more talented than I've ever been. You know, I mean, he, he could play the guitar, piano, the drums, mouth organ. He got his guitar then when he was about 15. And used to go and write bits on paper and write a bit of a song. And then he decided he, he'd like to go away to sea. Don't be late, don't forget we have a day, Colette. How I love you, Colette. We got to see this picture, so I think there was a girl in there named uh, Colette or something like that. It was like a a Frenchish type picture, one of those you want, like. I think that's where you got the idea for Colette. And the only thing you had to write on was a, a, a packet of wood bands. He was writing ideas down for songs and practicing his signature. And he was calling himself Steen Wade. Colette. They formed like a little group on the tug. Whereas one guy had a, um, the old fashioned bass with a pole and a string and another fella had a washboard and Billy had the guitar. So they called themselves the Formby Sniffle Gloop. Skiffle was just about coming out. I learnt a few Lonnie Donegan numbers and um, we used to play these on board the tug when we had nothing to do. Anyway, we used to sometimes sing to the passengers on the passenger liners. Ronnie's rebellious teenage nature had already led to his sacking from the welding plant and his days on the tugboats were over when he got into a fight with the captain. But Billy was about to find his true calling when rock and roll and Bill Haley arrived from America. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're gonna rock around the clock tonight. What did you glad back so? Join me home. We'll have some fun. Mad in Liverpool when everyone tried to go to see that rock around the clock. The rough tears got wrecked and it got banned and it was the good days and you know. They loved it, they screamed, they clapped, they shouted. style started to change. You know, when we were young, it was a Tony Curtis hairstyle and people would go around with the Tony Curtis and then you had this, the D8 thing came out. These gangs started to form and fights and this, that and the other. The Teddy Boy era, people used to say, oh, your son's this and your son's sexy. And of course, being old fashioned, you know, his dad did say, you know, didn't approve of things like that. My dad wouldn't let us dress with Teddy Boy tight trousers on and tight jeans on it. So they used to get hidden in the toilet because the toilet used to be at the bottom of the yard. I'd say, okay, Dad, see you later on. I won't be too late. And go out in my flappy trousers, nip round the entry, that's what they were called, entries or jiggers, climb over the wall into the yard and just change into my drainpipe trousers so I could go round in the style that everyone else was going around in. There's a place in Liverpool where when you buy a pair of jeans, 
if you wanted to get them taken in to like what they call drain pipes, it was two and six. But if you wanted double seam so they didn't split, it was five bob, just five shillings. We went to see a film which had just come out. It was called The Girl Can't Help It with Eddie Cochran. My corpse draped over a rail, but I climbed one, two, flat, three, flat, four, five, six, seven, flat, eight, flat, more. Up on the twelfth, I'm ready to drag with the fifteenth floor. I'm starting to say, get to the top, I'm too tired to rock. And a few of the fellas said, wow, uh, you really look like Eddie Cochran, so... I was rather flattered as I liked the kind of things that Eddie Crockham was doing. So off I went, started to grow sideboards, etc., and do my hair like Eddie Cochran. Last weekend, you told me you would love me right. Now, the Girl Can't Help It was the foundation, I think, uh, of British rock and roll. The strange thing was, I watched it in my hometown of Grantham, which is a hick town, really. Four years later, Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent were sleeping in my parents' house, a mile and a half from the theatre where I saw it. And who would have believed that? It certainly changed my life. I, know, I became Vince Eager because of Gene Vincent. And when you lived in the provinces, as he and I both did, you would listen to Radio Luxembourg at night and you'd send for your free copy of the NME. And it was another world, it was magic. Billy said to me about this Carol Levis discovery, he was doing something, you know. And I wrote to Carol Levis, and he went. He went to Carol Levis. Thank you, and how do you do, ladies and gentlemen? How do you do? We're all set to bring you another quick fire variety show for the stars of today and tomorrow. Funny enough, the Beatles were there at the same time. And of course, on the way home, he said at the station, a man put his hand on his shoulder and he said, Well done, son. If you ever need a a manager, let me know. Brian Epstein, he came up to him after he'd been with the Beatles to a Carol Levis audition, uh, and he, he listened to him and he thought, yes, he'll be great, and he, he wanted to sign him very badly, and went up to him as, uh, and tapped him on the shoulder and said, you need a manager and I'm your man. I need you so. And I'd already written to Larry Pons. He had a photograph done from the Star Gallery in Bold Street in Liverpool. And we sent that down also with a tape. He did a tape just with his guitar in one of these booths. We'd done this record in a Chicago studio in Liverpool called Phillips. That's where the Beatles recorded their first stuff. Anybody that bands around the end days recorded in this little, probably two track tape player. And he came out with this, with, a, with an LP. We sent that down to him. And then we never heard anymore for a while. My mum took upon herself to, um, get in touch with Larry Pons and say, look, if you don't want to do anything, could we please have this tape back or you may have somebody else that may be interested. So, uh, I don't think he ever did return the tape. He sent a letter saying, I'm at the Azeldo Theatre in, in Birkenhead, which is not too far from, from where we live. So if you'd like to come along there, I'll have a listen to him. I saw this young lad looking like a cross between James Dean and Elvis Presley, extremely good looking. And he came up to me and he said, excuse me, la, in a very broad, scarce accent, which I won't try to emulate. And he said, I sent some tapes to Mr. Palms and I haven't heard from him. The songs I wrote, I'd like to know if he liked them. Immediately, Larry saw Billy. You could see it was love at first sight, and rightfully so. I mean, like, he was just a very handsome guy. And Billy stands there in the middle of the room in front of Larry, Kenny, myself and Marty and he starts to sing this song and the dress room was there with, with the old style theatre dress rooms with a very small window at the top uh, and all of a sudden this screaming started as, as, as Ronnie as he was to become Billy started to sing at the end of the song we stand there pretty gobsmacked looking at each other wow start to applaud but all the screaming had got like bigger and bigger outside the, the theatre they heard him through this little window at the top. And Larry Pond said right away, well, um, what would you say if I told you to go on now? He said, I'll do it. So that's what happened. He went onto the stage. And apparently he tore the roof of wax. He just went down the storm. The girls went wild for him. I think he did uh, one of his own songs, maybe an Elvis song or something like that. He did a couple of songs. Well, I'm 
They did about a three minute rehearsal on Maybe Tomorrow and a song called Just Because. I went out and spoke to the audience, made an announcement, said a young man from Liverpool has come to audition and Marty Wilde and myself feel that he's really quite talented and would like to know your opinion. I was pushed through the curtains eventually by uh, Larry Pond and some stagehands and suddenly I was in this great big light with the microphone standing in front of me. I was really, really, really nervous. And as I started to sing, I was so nervous that my uh, knees were shaking. And everyone thought, wow, who's this guy with the shaking knees? And he came home to us and he said, I've got to go in the morning. I said, where? He said, I've got to meet uh, Larry Pons. I still gosh, I said, you can't do that. He said, it's my chance, I'm going. So it was Albert that carried his case and sawed him off there the next morning. He had his guitar. Oh, he didn't have a guitar case. So the only thing that was going was a pillow slip. Ronnie Witchley went off. And the next time I saw him, he was Billy Fury. To have a talented kid just show up at the backstage door is, is one of those rare show business stories where it works for everybody. The fans tend to look at it from the point of view of the artist. And here is where he was discovered. But for the impresario, it's also a great moment because a gold mine is opened. That Billy Fury story is as great for Larry Parnes as it was for Billy Fury. To the end, come on. His discovery by Larry Parnes would launch the awestruck Ronnie Witchley into a meteoric rise to stardom as Billy Fury. But the relationship was fundamentally flawed from the beginning. Parnes had discovered Tommy Steele in the Two Eyes Coffee Bar and then Marty Wilde. Like his protégés, Larry Pines was also just starting out in the music business. He had given Tommy and Marty reasonable contracts, but by the time Billy Fury burst onto the scene, Pines had decided that a weekly wage was better for the artist than a share of the income they generated. We went down to see Larry Pines. We made this contract out, which was Dad and I to go down and sign. And then he, he, he said he was on a percentage. He'd be so much percentage. And I think when he came to all, I think he'd be on about about twenty pounds, something like that, a week. I'm getting myself um, about um, between ten and twenty pounds a week, actually. Occasionally, I go on a mad spending spree <laughs> and uh, makes up. For... Pride, gentle, fury, eager. Why do you choose names like that? Well, this means something, you see. Uh, for example, with Fury, Billy is nice and friendly, and and Fury is a little bit ferocious, so gives him the mean streak. He said, what do you think about having a stage name? I had one thought up, which was Steen Wade. Then he said, what about Billy Fury? So we tossed a coin on it, and I won the toss, and thought that, uh, well, the next day there's going to be a picture of me in, in the Daily Mirror, and it's going to say Steen Wade. Next day there was a bang, bang, bang on my flat door, and I opened it, one of my friends was there, was there with a copy of the Daily Mirror, and there he had Billy Fury. Don't you ever feel that, that uh, you are being manipulated just like a puppet sometimes? As long as they do it right. No, I think it's up to you to go outside and the performance you do, it's, it's all your own, you know? All your own work, what you do on the stage. Pans had no real interest in the music business. He would leave it in the 1970s for the theatre. But his role as a pop impresario gave him two advantages. Lucrative earnings and access to young men who wanted to be pop stars. He thought I had a great talent and I was going to be a big star uh, and that he would make me into a big star. And uh, he, I, I didn't realise at the time how he was trying to hit on me. Larry was basically out for two things, the body of his client and the money he could make out of them. <laughs> He did have the first English album which was completely written by him, which is now a classic, The Sound of Fury. I want you close to me, I want to feel your heartbeat, baby. 
baby, don't you see you're here in the... Such good songs and everything, which he wrote with ten tracks on that, which were his, which at the time was unbelievable. The Sound of Fury is the best British rock and roll album and one of the best ever. Uh, of course, uh, there are a few uh, Americans who have this claim made, but no British people. Well, I give you my advice, but you don't care. I told you not to fool around with me. I would prefer the Elvis Presley Sun Sessions, but they weren't made as an album. They were a retrospective album put together from the singles. The Sound of Fury as an album um, was raw. It was before everyone got too conscious of trying to be clever about what they were putting in the album. They just got a bunch of songs together and put them down. I'll try to love you all again. Love you all again. Sound of Fury album was completed in less than a day. Ten tracks in less than a day. Some of them are probably one take. He goes from country to rock via rockabilly. Makes complete sense. And that's why the album worked. It wasn't contrived. It was from his heart. You want a honky tonk places on the side of town. All you wanted to do was knock a man's heart down. And then I thought she was my hobby. And then I took her to love and true. But then look Joe Brown mentions it in his act because I think Joe got paid the princely sum of about £2.50. For the search for the old days session, still got the receipt for it, Joe, for that. It was a classic album, and it was down to Jack Good, of course, and Joe, the icons of our time. If Billy had done nothing other than that classic 10 inch album, he would be revered today. Deck is also very proud to actually have in its catalogue what he's, what he's rated by you know, many people as the greatest rock and roll album ever in The Sound of Fury. Of all the English rock and roll kind of innovators, um, Billy stood out. I don't know why it was. I mean, Marty, I think, is brilliant. He's got a fabulous voice. Joe is great, brilliant on stage, good rock and roller. But Billy just had something when he walked on stage. He was a star. Don't knock upon the door. Don't want you anymore. Don't love you ever before. Well, you're gonna make me so. You a fool, I ain't a fool no more. When Billy and Jess did concerts, they didn't put Jess Conrad, nor did they put Billy Fury. They just put Billy in big letters. And even though there were several Billys around at the time, there was only one Billy, really. When he stood in the wings, you could feel the energy. I'd stood in the wings so many nights and watched him, because he was mesmerising. And he would come on in front of the tabs, you know, and then take ages to get a cigarette out and light it up. They just used to go wild. They started with a spotlight on his crotch, which I think had been padded out. <laughs> <laughs> and then the spotlight enlarged, you see, and you saw this very handsome young man, quite frail, and it was a terrific act. Don't wait about for me, I don't want you, can you see? Well, I got somebody new, and she ain't me like you. You When he worked on stage, he was dynamite. He took the whole place, he had him, had him in the palm of his hand. And he just oozed sex on stage. Every pose was practiced. Every angle was practiced. To the Empire to see him, and he didn't even know how we're going. I rode up in the circle, and he walked on, and he just had to raise his knee, and he screamed. I couldn't believe it, you know. And I was screaming a lot with the, with the girls. I can never get the hairs on the back of my neck, you know. And when I saw Billy in the Empire one time, I, I was exactly the same. Because he was so exciting on stage, he was, oh, what a performer on stage. They'd go on stage and they'd do a bit of the Elvis with the shaking of the hips and the legs and drive all, all the girls potty. And, and even the lads wanted to be like Billy Fury. They all had his hairstyle and things like that. <laughs> We did a tour of Ireland with them. They said to him, if you wiggle your, your hips once more, we'll pull the curtain down. This was at the Theatre Royal in Dublin. And so Billy did his usual thing, and down came the curtain. 
and we were thrown out of Ireland. During my days at the NME in the early 60s, Billy was again and again voted the best live act. Uh, and he was, he was fantastic to watch on stage. With the concert, when you were with Billy, if he was starting to carry on and gyrate, you couldn't hear yourself think. And then when he started to sing for real, for a romance, you could hear a pin drop. It was a, a peculiar windscreen wiper of an effect. Once, once upon a dream I met her long ago But somehow I can't forget her I met her Once upon a dream We built a castle where we plan to live together Precious moments in the land of never I met her once upon a dream Dreams can come true, darling That's what they say Prove that you're real And it's my lucky day Once, once upon a dream I met her, never, never thought we'd be together forever, riding on our dream. I met her, once upon a dream. One of Fury's biggest fans at the time was an aspiring Liverpool guitarist called John Lennon. His band, the Silver Beatles, had applied to be Billy Fury's backing band. The Beatles were fans of Billy, really, you know, I mean, Liverpool as well, you know, and John Lennon asked him for his autograph. The Beatles came to audition, basically, to uh, be Billy's backing band. And whether it was because Laddie Pons didn't think they were good enough or they didn't gel enough, they didn't get the job, but he did get them the job of backing Johnny Gentle. I said, what did you think then? He said, oh, they're a great group, but they're trouble. He said, I don't want to know as a backing group, they'd be trouble. And of course, I think he'd be right. I don't think John Lennon would have been made a very good backing group. Billy's performance on stage made him one of the most anticipated artists on the rock and roll spectaculars organised by Larry Parnes. The shows themselves were hard work, 90 days of gruelling touring which generated income for Larry Parnes and more health problems for Billy Fury. We said to Larry on time, we said, don't wake him too hard, you know, because if he could be down in, you know, London one day, one night, and in Scotland another night, and then back again, down to London, and then back up again to Scotland, which was, and of course, them days, they carried all the equipment and the travelling all, all squashed into one van. So we travelled in the coach, which we used to call the vomit box, obviously, for obvious reasons. I mean, we did stupid things like travelling from Edinburgh to the Isle of Wight. You know, Edinburgh one night, the next night we're on stage in the Isle of Wight. I remember that the trip particularly, I mean, I was actually on stage while we were working with Billy 
And I was actually eating sausage and chips out of a bag on the side of the drums, you know, because we didn't have time to eat. In those days, uh, getting round the country was certainly more difficult because there weren't the motorways that we have now. All you ever see is inside of a, a coach, on stage, a dressing room, and then if you're lucky, the hotel room. If not, like, you know, <laughs> unfortunately the band did was sleep in the coach. Larry Parnes' acts worked seven days a week. Morning, noon, and night. I mean, if they weren't in the recording studio or doing press interviews or something, they were doing concerts that night. They worked extremely hard. It was like a production line, you know. We, we could imagine that Larry Parnes had this room at the side of the stage with all these guys hanging up on, on hooks, you know, saying, right, OK, so on you go, it's your turn. You go and do, do a couple of numbers and come back off, and then the next one would go and he do a couple of numbers. His dad said to him, it's too much sun. He said, it's too much, five nights a week, it's too much for you. He said, Dad, I can do it. I can do it. Willis play, this was called Strictly for the Sparrows. The theme tune was the, Maybe Tomorrow, which Billy had wrote himself. And that was the theme of the, of the play right the way through. This is where Larry was smart. I was given a list of record shops, and I was given money, and I had to go to each of these shops and buy the record of Billy's Maybe Tomorrow, three from each shop. And they were shops that the charts used to do their compilation for the biggest selling records. Tomorrow, maybe tomorrow. Billy, I'm not saying he was effeminate, but he was pretty. He was like a Leonardo DiCaprio in a way. He was very pretty. So it doesn't surprise me that, that women were attracted to him. The boyfriends of the fans used to get very violent towards him because they were jealous of him. We were on stage and this guy walked up to Billy right in front and said, if you'll wiggle your bum once more, I'll smash your face in. Wherever Fury went, the fans would follow him. Before Beatlemania was even born, Britain was in the grip of Billy Mania. When he worked with Bill, he had a problem. The problem was getting out of the theatre afterwards because there were 4,867,000 girls all determined to have a piece of you. He'd leave out of one door and I'd leave out of the other door. We could never go out of the same door together. I don't know what would have happened then. I mean, I think there would have been a, um, serious injuries, I think. No way of getting out. It, it was so thronged, it wasn't true. And Billy says to me, I've got to be somewhere. And I said, uh, all right, I'll tell you what, I said, I'll go out and I'm going to run to the left and they'll all run after me and give them a half a minute or a minute and then you'll come out, but sneak out and run to the right. Well, the girls used to go out to the theatre and go round to the side door. I'd be shouting out, you know, we want Billy, we want Billy, like, you know, 2,000 girls, we want Billy, we want Billy. I sprung into the lions and I went out and they went, so I took off, and not being a bad runner, right, I took off down the road and they took off after me. There must have been a couple of thousand girls, unbelievable. All of a sudden, I got this distinct impression that I was running on my own, which I was, and I turned around because Billy had come out too early. And the last lot had seen him come out, and they all turned around like they know them birds in the sky that all fly like that. They all turned around and whoop. Some of them came at, at, at me with scissors, and you think, you know, what, what are you doing? And, and all they wanted was a button or a piece of hair. Now, immediately <laughs> opposite this theatre was a corner shop. So Billy, hotly pursued by 2,000 screaming ladies, run into the corner shop. And it literally was a corner shop. And the fella, who had maybe two customers in all day, sit there, and he looked up and he said, Oh, Billy Fury. And those were the last words he uttered because Bill leapt over the counter and tried to shoot out the back and next minute 2,000 girls 
clambered into the shop, knocked all the gear over, the leather, knocked a guy on the floor and everything like that. And he did manage to get away, but it was like that every time he went anywhere with him. And so he said, I could dance with you beneath the pale moonlight and I could hold you tight. When he came out the theatre, there'd be lots and lots of, of girls, obviously, around the stage door. And you, you enjoyed it. And occasionally you'd pick a girl up, you know, there's no messing about that you'd pick a girl up. They're after autographs and anything else they can get hold of. And uh, I don't think Billy was against, you know, being friendly with the girls. Girls trying to get into bedrooms and all sorts of uh, strange goings on. And some you let in and some you didn't. <laughs> I cultivated a lot of girlfriends, a lot of girlfriends. And Billy also had a lot of girlfriends. Uh, and I think that with Larry, he didn't like it. Billy lived in a flat opposite the Boy Scout headquarters with his very gay agent. I'm not saying they were gay together, because I don't think they were, but his very gay agent. He had all these boys in this big flat. The agent was called Larry Parnes, bless him. He told me that I would be staying with him for the night at his apartment in Buster Road in Knightsbridge. So I went back in his pink Cadillac, which of course, to a 17-year-old guy from Grantham, you know, redneck Riviera, he didn't know what a pink meant in those days. But he gets back to Larry's apartment, and in spite of the fact that there were five bedrooms, I had to sleep with Larry. And uh, that's when I found out, really, what the guy was about. And I managed to protect my innocence by threatening him with a table lamp, and also sleeping between the top sheet and the top blank bottom blanket, as opposed to going between the two sheets, which was a smart move. Dick Rowe of Decca Records recognised that Fury had star quality, but Rowe felt that Fury's haunting, emotive voice would be perfect for the big pop sound that was coming from America. With an orchestral accompaniment behind him, Billy Fury was about to become the biggest star of British pop. stars in the skies like the stars in your eyes they say to me that there'll never be no other love like yours for me if he hadn't have switched to covering american pop hits if he hadn't gone into early 60s pop but it stayed just rocking that he would never have enjoyed the success that he did enjoy. You are the one love that I'll adore. It's the British cover versions of the American rock and roll hits were almost always inferior. That's not because they weren't good artists, it's just that the chemistry that attends a recording session is so rare that if one person captures it on a song, it's incredibly unlikely that somebody else is going to capture it. And yet somehow, Billy Fury did it better. This is Billy Fury, and here's my most successful record, which spent six months in the charts, halfway to paradise. I defy anyone not to have the hairs go up on the back of their neck at that intro. Oh my gosh, this is better than Tony Orlando's version. Paradise was the one that took off, made him really massive. I want to be your lover, but your friend is the last day.
touch me so to know your heart's a treasure and that my heart is forbidden to touch so put your sweet lips close to You're known as Billy was then, you know, and every time you get a girl on your arm, people are photographing you and talking to you and all that business. Do you remember that picture there? Um, Alfred Hitchcock's the beards, and all the beards are sitting on the walls and the fences all around the house. And when you get up in the morning, it was just like that. You don't know when there'd be all these girls sitting along the wall, you know. It was good. He came home after um, he did the Empire, and he couldn't get in the house. The, the, the road was just absolutely packed. Both sides, it, it was just, you couldn't get through. She had to open a window and sing a song to all the friends out there, to all the girls. I found a place full of jobs A magic world in my baby bazaars A soft and breeze left set in the leaves A wondrous place that's when it got time that we had to move from the house that we were in because it just become unbearable. To cut love and stay nice and warm Away from home in my baby's arms A wondrous place It started to get a little bit of royalties coming in then. And that's when he said to me, Mum and Dad, go and pick a house and I'll sort of pay for it, you know. And that's how we come to be in the house that my mother in now. But I don't get when she holds me tight. Mm -hmm. I was in a quite a powerful relationship with Duffy Power, and uh, I'd been, I think I'd been with him about over a year at that time. And uh, Billy decided he, he thought I was for him, so he maneuvered himself into the right position. And we were together for eight years after that. We were always together. In fact, his backing group, the Tornadoes, called us Bill and Coo, because we were always somewhere together. That's love. That's love. My love. He said, I've got to tell you something before we get engaged. He was very serious. He said, I have a heart trouble, you know, and I don't think you'll have me for long. And of course, I did become engaged to him. In those days, the girls used to find out where Billy lived, and they would go to his house, and they would uh, do graffiti on the door, and they would scream, and faint, and ambulances would be called. The fans in those days were so horrendous, really. <laughs> You know, there was no privacy, we couldn't go anywhere. So in actual fact, we used to be abroad a hell of a lot. So we'd go to Jamaica, we'd go to Miami. We went anywhere where the English fans weren't. He was the only artist at the time to have his own monthly magazine, which is incredible when you think about it, with Cliff and the other UK artists. And all the photographs for it were taken in our flat. So I'm, I'm sitting watching TV one night and suddenly I, I hear this hysterical screeching at the door through the, through the letterbox saying, it's his wallpaper. <laughs> you know, and I went out to find these two girls had passed out, on the, passed out at my door. But they, because all the photographs for the Fury Monthly were taken in the flat, so every backing was, you could see through our letterbox. You'd look out the window and you'd see them scraping bits of paint off his car into an envelope of Billy Fury's paint. 
you know, to take away. I mean, they'd take, they'd take anything. It was just scary. Billy found that hard to deal with. He wanted to see these girls in a theatre when he was working, but not at his front door. And that's what forced him out to live in the country. We moved right the way out to uh, Sussex. And they, they still found us. I went out to, to put something in the bin one day and a girl jumped out. You know, it was as bad as that. You know, I mean, it was really seriously frightening. The, the fans were frightening. Now, just because you think you're so pretty And just because your mama thinks you're so hard to stay in town Just because you think you've got something That nobody else has got mm, You caused me to lose all my money Honey, you left and called me old Santa Claus Well, I'm telling you, baby, I'm not to do with you Cause, well, just because I'm telling you, baby, I was, you know I'm through with you, because I said, well, baby, you know it's just because. The stress of being a pop star idolized by millions didn't sit easy with Fury's private and shy nature. He was Ronnie Witchley off stage and Billy Fury on stage for a few hours a day. He came to Liverpool once. And we went out for a drink and he said, everyone's looking at me. And I said, well, they're going to look at you, aren't you? Because you're Billy Fury, aren't you, you know? When I do go on stage, it is an act. I'm pushing another part of my personality forward, a part which is mainly hidden for most of the time. The people who know me, I think they just sit there and say, well, this is just an act. I remember I spent a week with him in, in Great Yarmouth once when he was doing the summer season in the early 60s and got to know him quite well during that week. He was an unbelievably insecure person. I mean, we all know he was shy and that, that stage stance that he adopted, that James Dean look that he had with the hunched shoulders and the uh, hair swept back, people thought he was copying Presley, but he wasn't copying Presley. That was, that was his way of closing in on himself. Once he became Billy Fury, he, could, he, he acted it out. He would have made a good actor because he, that, that was all an act, that, because he didn't even resemble Billy Fury. He used to say to me, I'm supposed to be wild, you know. I said, you are indeed. He said, keep it going. He said, why? I said, because it's the wages. If you was a pussycat, I don't like you. So the wild is the wages. Ooh, all right. So he'd go on stage and be going, yeah, oh, and we'd be going mental, right? And he'd come off. And it was like you waved a wand. <laughs> Different guy. Hello, any fish and chips around here tonight? What's happening then? He came across as being so shy, and I think Larry Pons deliberately cut down his number of press interviews, and, and particularly radio and television, because Billy wasn't comfortable, and it came across. And the girls wanted to see the same excitement in an interview that they saw when he was on stage. Billy couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the latest disc, Billy? What's your latest disc? Um, well, I don't know what it is, what it's going to be, although um, I've got a few to do before Christmas. Mm. And um, the record company will probably choose one of those. Well, I've had a little prior information that your latest disc is going to be heard by Westford viewers in the Spin Along program mm -hmm. on January the 21st, and I'm sure they're all looking forward to that very much indeed. Mm -hmm. We've done a show up in Birmingham and I'd come down in the car with him and Larry and they dropped me off in London and it had been a pleasant ride, a pleasant time, etc. And then Billy realised he was supposed to be wild. So as I'm walking away from the car, he winds the window down and he goes, <laughs> for no reason. And I went, well done, Bill. And he wound the window back up again. And that was his contribution to being wild. When you consider the type of show he did, where he got banned in Dublin, for, for his sensuality. You know, he was, as the song says, he was devil or angel. Lee had something very sensual about him. And men liked Billy as well as women. He had this little boy lost charm where older people wanted to mother him. Everybody fell in love with him, you know. Billy and Elvis had the same characteristic in that they were both incredibly good looking and shy and that is a devastating double act for girls 
you get somebody that looks like Billy or Elvis and, and they drop their heads and so it a bit like, ah, the girls want to, they want to eat them. You know, they want to barbecue them there and then. Obviously he probably did have a, a bit of a, a laugh now and again and things like that, you know. It could be a bit of a bugger for the women though. Larry Parnes very cleverly got Colonel Tom Parker to agree that Billy should go to America and present him with, some, with a gold disc. Elvis was making a film called Girls, Girls, Girls. Uh, Parker was keen to get some of the songs that Billy had written together because Elvis had heard some of his music and, and realised it was, it was the kind of music that he made. He'd been introduced as England's Elvis to Elvis. And he'd gone over there with Jimmy Savile and probably Larry Pons as well. I said to him, what's it like meeting Elvis Presley? He said, he's not half tall. They shook hands, they gave each other discs, because Elvis had a silver one to present to Billy as well. And Elvis told me later, I had this from the very man's lips, that he just stayed on the set all day and never said a word, never spoke to him. And Elvis was very confused about that. Why did this kid come all this way to, uh, to meet me? And he didn't say anything. After Billy returned from meeting Elvis on the set of Girls, 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 Elvis had a number one with Return to Sender, but Billy's recording manager, Dick Rowe, thought another song from the film, Because of Love, would make an excellent single for Billy Fury. Because of love, I'm a hundred feet tall. Although Parnes was a shrewd businessman and the Simon Cowell of his day, he was also a sexual predator. You'd come in at midnight and it would be officers or sailors' coats hanging up with their hats on the top. And you knew he'd got two, three, four guys back. And that was very hard to come to terms with because people are obviously in the business going to associate you with this lifestyle because you're living with them. And I, I know that Billy suffered badly with it, with getting to terms with it, as I did. I really couldn't handle it. Jealousy. Billy was screwed up by Larry Pons, jumping on him every five minutes nearly day. But that was Larry Pons. And... The situation that Billy and I found ourselves in was that we were not Londoners. Marty and Tommy went home, they could talk to their parents. My parents didn't even have a phone, I couldn't phone them. There were no phones in the houses them days. We'd have to go to the corner and phone. If an I rang, you'd say, I'm fine, Mum, I'm fine, you know, but... You could never really get down to know what was happening. We all know what we're doing. No matter how naive we may pretend to be, when you get into this business, nine, nine times out of ten, you need someone to give you a break. My recording manager for a while was one of the biggest recording managers ever, EMI, a guy called Norman Newell. And Larry just told me straight one day, either you go to bed with Norman Newell or you'll never have a hit. And I said, OK, pal, there you go. I didn't say it confidence as that because we were only, eight, what, 19 or 20, but I sort of said, no, I'm not doing that. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do it. Larry's gayness confused Billy enormously about his own sexual uh, uh, life. And that led in later years to enormous problems for Billy Fury. Fury's relationship with Parnes was complex. Whilst Fury found it hard to deal with Larry's lifestyle, he was a regular guest on the holidays that Billy and Lee took. When your pretty eyes are filled with tears And the sounds of this cruel world are ringing in your ears In the early days, in the 60s, uh, the only people that took drugs were jazz musicians. They used to smoke reefers, I mean, and, and occasionally they'd have a, a purple heart, you know, so. And, and as musicians, we just thought that's why they played so well. The only times that I've ever known Billy to smoke was before he went on stage. To publish, you know, whatever. Either calm himself down or give himself a lift. We'd get a purple heart for a shilling, I think it was, and you'd break it in half and, and then break that in half again because you couldn't afford it anymore. You'd have a quarter of one 
because you had to do three one-hour sets. One of the first things he did in the morning was roll a joint, and he never looked any different. He was never out of it. It gave him some feeling of peace. He smoked like you which wasn't the thing in those days. I mean, this was the Beatle era when everybody was popping pills and speed. Billy went the other way. It helped him cope. It helped ease the strain on his heart. Every club you went into through in the 60s, they were smoking and taking this and taking that and, and dropping this and dropping that. And it, it became, and I think Bill got into all that like everyone else did. We all tried it. Anyone who was around at that time who said they didn't, they're either lying or they were very, very lucky. Very lucky. Play it cool, baby. Play it cool. Don't forget that golden rule. Now we're flying high. In the very early 60s, uh, something very strange happened in England. Young people suddenly had money. They had buying power. And they changed the entire pattern of British cinema. Let's paint the town, come on, have some fun. Have a good time, everyone. The night is out, we're gonna paint the town. When the bands played the cinema, say on a Wednesday, the takings were enormous, and when the films played it on the rest of the week, the takings were rather small. So the people in the movie business said, we're gonna make a movie with Billy Fury which delighted me. I hadn't made a feature film before. It was my first feature film. Colonel Tom Parker had put Elvis into the movies. Larry thought that it'd be a good idea to put his artist in the movies. We just got a phone call one day and said, um, we'd like you to do a film with Billy Fury. Well, it was fantastic for me. I mean, he was one of my idols, and so to be doing a film with him was brilliant. Then he served you with a mighty good dose of love potion number nine. Called the school of tick, magical barbaric I didn't want to make it at Pinewood Studios, but in those days they believed, or the old brigade believed, you made films in studios and you put up fairly shoddy replicas of places you could have gone to uh, in London that were sitting there. And it was the old story, you know, you get there at five o'clock in the morning and sit around for hours on end and nothing happens and, and Bill had his own dressing room and everything else, you know, spoiled to death. And he came out at the last minute and said, hi man, all right, you know, and then went on stage and that was it. I'm doing the twist yeah. all the day. Yeah. Ran the go, so get out of my way when I'm swinging my hips. Play it cool. It was Britain's first twist film, but the twist had not arrived in England. Nobody knew how to do the twist. We had to have people on the set from America giving twist lessons. The sound man was an old Pinewood sound man, a great sense of humour. And I would scream through the megaphone, all right, everybody twist. And he'd put bass over and on through the loudspeakers. <laughs> I mean, it was a laugh a minute. It was very funny, the film. <laughs> I know that Billy was frightened of Michael Winner when he was making him play it cool because he didn't see himself as an actor. Winner terrified him. He still does terrify a lot of people. I'm in the canteen in the restaurant and I see these boys sitting at the table with Billy Fury and they're taking up the whole table. He's sort of sitting on a corner, Billy, like this. He could hardly eat. So I said, excuse me, fellas. I suggest you give William Fury a little room to have his lunch and to realize how lucky you are that you're here with him. Well, Billy was quite embarrassed by this. I said, well, don't make a fuss, because he was so sweet. I said, William, I'm sorry it's wrong, dear. You're the star of the movie, and you're entitled at least to have the same room for lunch as these other bit players. <laughs> the arduous work involved in making a film caused Fury to be hospitalized for three weeks after Play It Cool was finished. When he was discharged, Parnes took him on a trip to America with a view to breaking fury in the States. He performed on Jack Good's US TV show, Shindig, but Parnes was lukewarm about Billy's opportunities in the States. The British invasion of America would have to wait for the next sound from Liverpool, the Beatles. It's ironic, actually, that Billy was close to the Beatles because when they really happened in 1963, uh, that was more or less the end for solo singers. A lot of the 
the bubblegum pop artists that were around, single singers, were just pushed to one side. Larry stopped putting the shows on, uh, which I think, because the, the audiences dropped. I think it was just, uh, just trends changed completely. Have you any plans for any more films? The same kind of thing, a musical. I hope with a bit more story this time mm-hmm. and a bit more time to spend on it. And um, I think it's going to be technical. He had an affair with Amanda Barry on the second movie he did. Um, oh. the one, and all our animals, those were all our animals in that. The horse was ours. Then it can't be far. So there he was having an affair with the leading lady and all my dogs were witnessing it. Not very nice. <laughs> After his breakup with Lee and an affair with Amanda Barry, Billy married Judith Hall. It was a short and unhappy marriage and Fury frequently returned to stay with Lee and her new husband, Kenny Everett. He came round and tried to make up. So, but there was, it was no going back. It was, it, it would, you know, I'd found out about everything of him. Me, you unhappy. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. You can't really mean it's all over. Give me a chance. Don't walk away. Billy married my best friend. And really, I think he did it out of spite. I'm out of shock. I never thought Billy was the type to be able to settle down with a, a particular person. No, he had... I think he was, he was very hard to please, in a, in a way. It's just a pity he never got somebody in his life who loved him as much that he could probably love somebody or care for somebody, but he didn't ever meet nobody like that. For good I got the hippie, hippie shade. We're all doing this little cabaret circuit. I mean, you'd see Billy or Marty at the, the, the Piper Club in Preston, which was a great venue. But all it was was a, a northern cabaret club. It wasn't the big theatre that we were used to doing. It's disillusioning when you've been a, a rock and roll person to go out and suddenly find you doing cabaret. Yeah, in the back. Woo, the hippie, hippie shade. Perhaps he'd just got disillusioned because he wasn't selling records anymore and he wasn't doing tours. And he decided the best thing to do was to pack it in. Billy, of course, was unfortunately was, uh, was not a healthy lad. Never. He seemed to come and go in the public persona. He seemed to do something and then disappear, come back, and if you weren't close to him, you didn't know the reason why. I was due to do a tour with Billy in the early 70s. We were going to do a tour together, and about two weeks before the tour started, uh, he was rushed into, I think it was Paddington Hospital, where he had the, 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 the valve you know, the valves replaced. The operation was horrendous for him. Um, he. He was awake right the way through it, not able to move and not able to speak, and he actually felt everything. So when he came to stay with us, he was so ill, but he was also traumatised, really badly traumatised. He literally, in desperation, moved in with me because he knew I'd look after him. Don't give your love to someone. Me and Kenny had a farm in Wales, and I'm pretty certain, of course, of Billy dropping in as a friend to visit them on a regular basis that he probably got a love for, for Wales through that because it was a lot more remote and a lot less hassle. Ended up with a farm which he loved the farm more than anything because there's peace down there. And he loved that. He always had loads of time for fans and things like that. But to get on that farm and go out in the fields with a camera and spend the whole day out there just waiting to get a certain shot of a bird. I didn't even know a blue tit when I met him, you know. And in the end, I mean, I'd spent hours slugging up Snowdonia with cameras and hides on our backs, waiting to photograph ravens. He would have liked to have gone on to do ornithology and photograph his birds and, and, and live a life completely dedicated to birds. But uh, it was the birds of the other kind, really, that <laughs> paid his wage. <laughs> Nineteen seventy-three. That'll be the day. And he rocked hard and heavy, heavier uh, and harder than he'd ever done before or ever would again.
In 1978, Billy Fury was made bankrupt following a bill for unpaid taxes from the Inland Revenue. The unpaid taxes dated back to 1962 and amounted to £16,780. Fury was advised to become bankrupt and was forced to sign over his royalties and publishing income. I don't think he realised how much trouble he was really in with the tax people. He'd gone through the trauma of going bankrupt, which I don't think he should have done. Badly advised again. Um, when you go bankrupt for £16,000, it's what it is at the price of a car. I think it's ridiculous, but there you go. I think there was other things going on behind that I didn't quite understand, and I don't think he understood. Larry Parnes was known to be extremely frugal <laughs> or tight with money or long pockets and short arms. The people he managed or his stable that he put out on shows, they, um, he was very tight with how much he paid them. I was on, what, £20 a week? Pay your own expenses. You know, I know it was the 50s, which sounds a lot of money, but when you, you know, the hotels were still sort of two, three quid a night and you're doing seven nights a week, you know, that's, that's 21 pounds, you know, so you're lucky if you've got enough to eat on. Peter Jane and Joe Walkers, half of them went down with malnutrition, you know, because they couldn't afford to eat. The rock and roll tours that Larry Parnes was organising with Robert Stigwood highlighted how Parnes was shortchanging Fury. Whilst Fury, an established star, was only being paid 50 pounds a week by Parnes, Stigwood was paying 1,000 pounds per week to the newcomer, John Layton. A thousand pounds a week in 1962 um, was really quite a lot of money and it got in the press and Billy found out about it and I don't think he was too happy about that. He was fine with me but he wasn't too happy with Larry Parnes and I think because I don't know what Billy was on, knowing Larry Parnes he was probably on about 50 quid a week. <laughs> what happened to Billy Fury's millions? But there must have been millions made, there's no two ways about it. I was earning more money than him singing in nightclubs, you know, which was ridiculous, and he was top of the bill. I wrote quite a few B-sides with Billy that I never got a penny for, of course, because Larry Pons managed to sew us all up. <laughs> Bless him. How would I criticise myself? Instead of going for a happy and enjoyable career to just help other people and try to help people become famous stars, perhaps I should have been a little more uh, selfish towards my bank balance. Larry lived a strange life, uh, and it ended in a most bizarre way. The last couple of years of his life, even though he was living in a very expensive West End apartment, he died of malnutrition because he was terrified of financial insecurity, the thought that his money, and he'd made a lot of money out of the likes of Billy Fury. He was afraid that that money would run out, and he lived the last two years of his life eating cat and dog food out of tins. Billy had had better management and, and per, more personal management, I think he would have been massive. With Colonel Parker managing him, he would have been number one all over the world, no question about it. He had to go in the studio to record a new album for KTEL, and Fury was on the road once again. My hopes, my dreams come true, my life I give for you, my heart a wedding ring, my own, my everything, my heart launching a comeback. He was persuaded to make another record, and why not? He needed the money. We all know he needed the money. 
in, in that time period, uh, Britain had a lot of famous people who were not rich. And in show business, other people got the money that was generated by the artists. Billy Fury was one of those people. He was doing the nightclub scenes and he, he looked pretty good. And, you know, he had long hair, changed his image completely. He was brilliant. He was, he was his old self, if not better. He was doing the social clubs. It's not everybody's cup of tea, especially when you've been a big star. The money became difficult. People didn't want to pay you. Uh, he ended up on really bad wages, you know what I mean? I mean the, way, the money was so bad, it's unreal. Talking about the hard times, hard times, yeah, who knows better than I. He was doing that, and then of course he was ill again. And he'd had an operation in 1972. He'd had another one in 76. He was, became very, very slim. At one time I thought he looked like he'd just come out of a concentration camp, actually. I had done Marty Wilde's This Is Your Life, and I think everybody there, to a man, was distraught when they saw Billy walk in. He was skeleton. Billy Fury's appearance on Marty Wilde's This Is Your Life show was a shock to all his friends and fans. Fury was a shadow of the great rock and roll performer. He looked ill, tired, and he was painfully thin. The heart illness that had dogged Fury all his life was now taking its final toll. Devil or angel, dear whichever you are, I love you, I want you, I love you. You look like an angel, your smile is so divine, but you keep me guessing. to think why are you so thin and I, I, I maybe it was he just didn't eat maybe he did have anorexia or something like that I don't really know everybody had heard he was poorly but they had no idea as to what extent and, uh, and that was the last time I saw Billy sadly they needed to do the open heart surgery again and he rang me up and he said Lee I would not go through that again I'd rather die so I won't have the operation through the last part of his life Lisa Rosen became Billy Fury's partner. They lived on his farm in Wales where Billy found peace with nature. So when I used to go to the farm, he'd always have injured owls there, or he'd pick one up on the road that'd been injured and bring it back and nurse it and then release it again. Because it became very... Uh, I think he loved animals more than people. Rise in the morning You're not around Searching all over, you can't be found as then in the evening by the moonlight. I'll hold you, darling. I'll hold you tight. I love you, baby. So hear my prayer Maybe tomorrow You'll understand Then we'll go walking Hand in hand and Then in the evening By the moonlight I'll hold you darling Maybe
tomorrow. On January the 27th, 1983, Billy Fury worked late into the evening on the songs for his latest comeback. The following day, Lisa left him to sleep on, but Billy Fury never woke. The king of rock and roll ballads had died aged just 42 years old. The world of pop music would never find another Billy. Play it cool, baby. Why don't you play it cool? Don't you forget that golden rule. I heard the news about Billy Dime. It was actually when I was at work. My wife phoned me up and I said, you know, she kept on saying to me, you know what I'm saying, don't you? Billy's dead. I said, no, can't be. I rang Lisa to find that, yes, he had died in the night, you know. So, and then everybody piled around to my flat to sort of, we had a wake. Ev came around, Elton came around, everybody came around, you know. We just all had a wake for Billy. When he went, uh, there was nobody to fill his place. He was there. He was the man, and when he left us, there was no more man left. Such a bad time, you know, I mean, it's one of those things that takes a lot to sink in. I blame people around him for him dying so young, to be truthful. He was pushed a lot, I think. I think he, he pushed him a lot, too much. The people hadn't been so interested in just grabbing money. Um, it lasted a lot longer, a lot more longer, and give us a lot more music and a lot more memories, you know. But can't do nothing about that now, can we? All we can do is play his music and keep his memory alive, and we're going to do that forever. I'll show you a valley that stays evergreen. The fan club also helped to drive, in fact we did drive and coordinate the bronze statue project. On the 20th anniversary, it was in place in Liverpool in 2003. The fans, they've all became friends over the years. We have uh, meetings now at the statue because the fans raise the money for the statue. Behind me is the statue of Billy Fury at the Museum of Liverpool Life. It was donated by the Friends of Billy Fury and it's become a place of pilgrimage where they can come and lay flowers on special dates, the anniversary of his death or his birthday. And of course it's just been moved, it's, uh, it's now out on the pier head in the fresh air and uh, I'm sure Billy is quite happy to be looking towards where the tugboats uh, were that he used to work on. We actually do a Billy Fury medley in the, in the show. You mentioned Billy Fury. The place erupts. Decker may have missed out on the Beatles and that's, that will go down in history, but we did sign Billy Fury. He's left us with some great memories. He's left us with some great songs. And he's left us remembering what I like to think was just a great era. It was a very, very exciting era. Unbelievable, man. And I still love him, still miss him. Always will. Hold me tight 